Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the weekly chart of silver provided by netdania.com. You can see this is the long term chart. This is um, still fundamentally a bull market. Now, I want to talk about two things here in this update. There's, there's going to be a lot of information, so I'm going to have to talk really quickly because I'm going to be talking both about the precious metals and about cryptocurrencies. But um, the two important topics when you're talking about markets, and we're going to see this when we look at Jesse Livermore, um, are fundamentals and technicals. Those are the two big um, factors when you're trading markets. Now, if you remember Market Wizards number one, that's the classic by Jack Schwager. Um, that's probably going to be as far as investment knowledge that book is going to be number two behind Jesse Livermore's autobiography Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. Uh, by the way, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator is cited by at least half of the people interviewed in uh, Market Wizards. But Livermore came up with uh, these concepts of fundamental and technical analysis. Now there's, there's also tape reading but we're not going to talk about that. So fundamental analysis is the belief that something that is overvalued or undervalued, undervalued should be bought or sold based on that and based on the fact that values ultimately return to an equilibrium price, a fair price. Now what that fair price is, is, is going to be determined by what the majority of people think. That's always going to be the case. Um, so there is no real intrinsic value. There's no, there's nothing like the Marxian concept of um, uh, a labor theory of value, anything like that. Uh, labor theory of value is completely false. So something has value strictly based on how people value it. And this is obviously true. We can see this in the case of silver, that uh, silver doesn't have any value right now because they've managed to convince everybody that it has no value. Now, that doesn't mean that they won't be convinced in the future. So fundamental analysis is the belief that something should be bought when it is undervalued fundamentally. Uh, you, you don't determine that by looking at a chart. You determine that by uh, an, analyzing how much of it there is, how much it's used, all those things. With silver, that's going to be how little physical silver there is, how important of a commodity it is, how much it goes into manufacturing, um, even how much it's suppressed. That's actually a fundamental um, issue. Uh, technical issues, on the other hand, are strictly chart issues. So this long-term trend line that I've drawn here that shows that sil silver is actually still in a bull market. Um, even though most people would say that this crash from 50 down to uh, 15 was a bear market, it is a, a very large bear market, but longer term, silver is actually still in a bull market. Now that's strictly a technical thing. So technical things have to do with breakouts and uh, why people buy and sell. And again, if you want to understand how support and resistance work, which really are the two primary um, inputs into technical analysis, um, overhead resistance and under uh, support, uh, underlying support. Those are the two big factors in technical analysis. Uh, how many people are overhead waiting to sell into you? and how many people are down below waiting to buy. Those are the two in technical analysis. And, and, and Livermore actually goes into both. So um, the reason to buy silver right here is about 90% fundamental and maybe 10% uh, technical. Uh, the reason why I say it's 10% technical is because you can see that we actually have a breakout through this downtrend line and a bit of a rally in the MACD. Um, but a technical trader would tell you that bottom fishing is a really dumb thing to do. Uh, as Livermore said, that uh, th uh, dead fish can stay dead for a long time. In other words, a market 
that goes down and can stay down for a very long time. There's no reason that a market that goes flat just deadlines down about 90%. There's no reason why it should wake up. Um, so let's look, let's visit the cryptocurrencies and the recommendation that I made. And then we're going to get back to some stories about uh, China and silver, and there's just a lot to cover. So we'll start with let's go to the flow uh, chart here. So this is the chart of the Florin coin. Now, if you remember in the last video, I was getting in at uh, about, um, I think it was 0 0.006. So we're about twice the price of where I got in. Um, you can see that, that there's been a lot of, of buying coming in. Now, one of the things that we're going to see when we look at the Livermore uh, excerpt is how to successfully manipulate a market. Now, um, this actually is not a market I'm trying to manipulate because actually uh, these coins, I'm as I buy them, I'm taking them off the market. I'm not uh, selling them. Um, I have a sell order way, way, way higher here. Uh, it's even off this chart here. It's in the threes somewhere. Um, but I have not sold one of these coins and I have millions of them at this point. And, uh, and, and it's because I fundamentally believe in what this coin can do, which is basically create a library of uncensorable peer-to-peer uh, -peer information. So there's no reason why I wouldn't want to just continue to accumulate the coin. Um, I made my case, really, I didn't promote the coin. There's a lot of things I could do. I could go onto the Bitcoin channel and uh, pump this coin and try to dump it. Uh, I don't believe in pump and dump. And uh, uh, because that's there, there, there is some immorality to that. If you're pumping something just for the intention of dumping it, uh, then really you're just trying to trick people. But if you're promoting something because you believe in it and you're owning it, like the early investors to Microsoft or Cisco, uh, you can imagine if you were an early investor in Microsoft or Cisco and you said you, you bought tons of shares at a really cheap price and then you went out and wrote an article saying hey this is great this is a great idea this is going to be the future and then you held on to those shares and sold some when they were way way high uh, that's not a pump and dump and so um, that's not what I believe in doing so this is how Florin coin is performing now I want to show you one other coin that uh, I've selected here and that is because this is a proof of stake coin um, so that's a little bit different idea. This is the Zeitcoin. And again, uh, wow, we had a big sell off. <laughs> so that took me by surprise. Um, so this coin is a coin that I believe in as well. And it's because of fundamentals and technicals. So if you read Market Wizards and uh, look through the interviews of the people who are it's about 50 50 about half of them are technical based people and about half of them are fundamental based people but there's some that are kind of in the middle and they will tell you that if you can find a market deal where it's both fundamentally sound and technically sound then it's kind of like a can't lose proposition so this coin was another coin that i selected and that's because this is a proof of stake coin now i went through literally hundreds of coins and one of the first things I'm looking for is that there's an active market. The next thing I'm looking for is that there's actually uh, the ability to change the price based on your buying as opposed to just everything locked up dead. Uh, make sure that there's activity. You can see massive activity. So this is going to be the next coin that I'm looking at now, quote unquote, manipulating, although I'm actually just accumulating. So this is Zeit, Z-E-I-T. Um, and I'm just gonna let the members know about this. I'm gonna start accumulating this coin. Now let's look at the proof of stake concept because that's what this is based on. Proof of stake is a method of securing a cryptocurrency network and achieving distributed consensus through requesting users to show ownership of a certain amount of currency. It is different from proof of work systems that run by difficult hashing algorithms to validate electronic transactions. 
Pure coin was the first cryptocurrency to launch proof of stake. Other prominent implementations are found in BitShares, NXT, Blackcoin, New Shares, New Bits. Now, actually, this Zeitcoin is a big. Um, it's a big, like environmental friendly type of coin. So, the reason why this is being promoted as an environmental type of friendly coin is that it doesn't have the huge load of miners that Bitcoin has. You, you just go and get the wallet and get your coins and then you're assigned coins uh, in an interest rate environment based upon how many you have. There isn't this massive amount of mining. It just grows uh, and uh, the larger your stake and that you can prove, the more you get. So, but again, uh, this coin was one I selected out of hundreds based on this technical pattern that it was approaching a breakout from its beginning. It is breaking out a cup and saucer formation. Uh, the market is active and liquid and uh, it's easy to buy. So there were a lot of factors why I chose this coin. So um, the FLO was successful. I think this ZEIT will be successful. So I'm again, I'm letting the members know about this right now. So we're going to talk a little bit about China and then we're going to get back to cryptocurrencies. So uh, this is a very important story. Uh, there's another story on this. I don't think I found the original, but this is about the Chinese and how they're buying up real estate in America. Now, most of you are aware of the fact that there's a large trade deficit between the United States and China. Um, anywhere from 500 to 500 billion to a trillion dollars a year. We don't know how large it is. And uh, there should be, although we don't see it yet, tremendous pressure uh, on the U.S. dollar because of this. But because there's a peg between the Chinese yuan and it's not a freely floated currency. So the currency is still locked up. So the Chinese can't just go out and invest in anything they want. The Chinese government is still not allowing that to happen. But they do allow the Chinese to form LLCs and corporations overseas. So, for example, if you look at the Vancouver, uh, BC real estate market, it's absolutely through the roof. The Chinese have been involved there for, for decades. And it's one of the most in, overinflated uh, real estate markets in, in the world. And most people would ask, well, why is that? Why is the Chinese, uh, why is the Vancouver real estate market so, so high? What's so great about Vancouver, British Columbia? Well, it's because they're allowing the Chinese to come in there and buy. Uh, and so uh, if you allow the Chinese to come in and buy, then you're going to get an inf uh, inflation in whatever you allow them to buy. Because you have, a lot of people say this is uh, corrupt Chinese officials trying to get their money out of China. And there is some truth to that because uh, we've seen outright executions of billionaires in China. We've seen uh, dozens of billionaires just disappear in China. And a lot of very, very wealthy people, China has a tremendous amount of money now. And there's a tremendous amount of rich people in China. And they want to get that money out. You know, there's a chance of being executed by the government. They want to get their money out, get themselves out and uh, live their lives and, and, and leave their wealth to their children. So that's why you're seeing this move. Now, what you're seeing is in, in, in Canada, an accommodation to the Chinese, but it's now happening in America. So let's read a little bit of this. Has the United States ever experienced a time when a foreign nation has attempted to buy up so much of our land all at once as Michael Snyder's details below, it appears the Chinese are on a real estate buying spree all over America as they are now the dominant buyers of investment green cards. This is occurring as private equity buyers and hedge funds exit the buy to rent business en masse and are, as Mike Krieger explains, desperate to pitch American property to anyone willing to keep housing bubble 2.0 inflated. It seems Zillow is more than happy to enable that. Z quote, Zillow agreed to make its U.S. property listings available to Chinese consumers through a partnership with a Beijing-based website. As the American Dreams Michael Snyder explains, the Chinese are on a real estate buying spree all over America. In fact, in some cases, large chunks of land are actually being given to them. 
Yes, you read that correctly. China is on the way to becoming the dominant landowner in the entire country, and that is starting to alarm a lot of people. Do we really want a foreign superpower to physically own so much of our territory? There are some that are playing down this threat by making a distinction between the Chinese government and Chinese corporations, but things work differently over in China than they do here. In China, the government is involved in everything. In fact, 43% of all corporate profits in China are produced by companies that the Chinese government controls, and all the rest of the companies are very careful to follow the lead and direction of the Chinese government. So there's a little China bashing there, but again, uh, the big issue here is the Chinese with a lot of money. Now, uh, one criticism that's going to be made is that, well, these are corrupt Chinese officials. They just want to get their money out of there. It's looted and stolen money, and they're corrupt government officials, and they're trying to you know, get out with a lot of money. Well, that could be the case. And the question I would ask you is that if that's the case, then our corrupt government officials here in the U.S. Uh, who are trying to get out or invest somewhere else, uh, do they have billions or is it millions? Because we're seeing billions coming across from China. Um, but how many how many U.S. politicians or U.S. I'm not saying U.S. politicians aren't corrupt because they are, but most of the U.S. politicians are actually going to be millionaires and multimillionaires. We're t these people in China that are coming over here are billionaires. Um, so we're talking about a, a very large amount of money. Uh, that's going to tell you that China is very, very successful. So when is this block from the Chinese currency being freely traded going to be lifted? I don't know. But when it does, there's going to be an avalanche. I don't even know which way. I don't know if the currency is going to explode versus a dollar or collapse. But there's going to be some very, very violent moves when the Chinese currency finally moves. Now, let's get back to something that has to do with China and cryptocurrencies. Believe it or not, um, this is an article. It's a while ago, but most of you uh, might remember that uh, I did an article attacking Bill Still when Bill Still did an attack against Bitcoin. Now, Bill Still is a Quaker. He is, in my opinion, a communist, and uh, he had he had injected himself. He ran for president. He had injected himself into the libertarian movement, and uh, I did a video that was a big criticism of him. I got copyright strikes from him directly. Had to pull it down. That's okay. I don't care. Uh, but uh, yeah, this guy, in my opinion in my humble opinion, is a snake in the grass. Now, he actually came out criticizing Bitcoin, and then he recommended Quarks. And I thought it was Ripple, but it was actually Quarks. But let's take a look at Ripple here, because they're both similar in that they are actually not decentralized cryptocurrencies, but they're actually centralized. And you can see here this article that just came out today on Zero Hedge. It begins... U.S. government issues $700,000 fine against a digital currency. This is Simon Black. Well, it was bound to happen sooner or later. Our beloved amigos at the U.S. Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, have just issued a first-ever civil enforcement action against a virtual currency. The offending criminal mastermind in this case, Ripple Labs. If you're not familiar, Ripple is a virtual currency platform that was once a darling of Silicon Valley, attracting top VC firms like Google Ventures and Andreessen Horowitz. Ripple's technology allows users to conduct financial transactions with one another, sending and receiving payments in cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin as well as fiat currency. Imagine, do you see that? Bitcoin as well as fiat currency. You see that? They tied it to fiat and then brought FinCEN in the door. Imagine Bitcoin meets PayPal and you have the basic idea. As part of its technology, the parent company Ripple Labs also created a native virtual currency called XRP, which is the second largest in the world after Bitcoin when measured by market cap. Uh, no, I think Litecoins, we'll check that. Because of all these features, Ripple Labs qualifies as a money service business, MSB, according to FinCEN, which makes them subject to all sorts of regulations. At the top of the list is the Bank Secrecy Act, BSA, which 
contrary to its name, requires banks and MSBs to betray their customers' financial secrets to the U.S. government. Specifically, the BSA mandates that all banks and MSBs file suspicious activity reports if they know, suspect, or have reason to suspect the transaction of $2,000 or more is suspicious. And in the age of the USA Patriot Act, suspicious transactions are big business for Uncle Sam. Last year, a record 2.4 million suspicious activity reports were filed. That's a 40% increase from 2013's record year of 1.7 million. As you can imagine, Ripple Labs failed to register with FinCEN as an MSB, nor did it submit suspicious activity reports in its compliance. In its compliant, FinCEN describes several of the OO nefarious violations. So, uh, wish I had time to go through that. You're going to have to read that yourself. I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe that Ripple is actually not a decentralized cryptocurrency. It seems to me that if they can find somebody $700,000, then there's a somebody to find. Uh, if you have a decentralized cryptocurrency, there's nobody to find. So that would tell you that uh, that's centralized. Now, let's get over to the Jesse Livermore uh, article because I wanted to explain to you how um, you can use fundamental and technical analysis to put up, quote unquote, a market. And that's what I'm involved in doing. It's, not, it's nothing nefarious because I'm not selling anything. Uh, it's just, uh, I eventually probably will sell something, uh, but keep the, the rest, probably 95% I'll keep. But this is just a good description of how the, the technicals of putting up a market works. Because there are very specific ways of putting up a market and creating interest in a market. So let's read this. This is actually Livermore describing Keen. Keen was probably the greatest stock operator to ever live, probably greater than Livermore, but there was nothing written of him uh, that was specifically about his operations like we know about Livermore. But Livermore talks about him, so we'll start here. It's a matter of regret that Keene did not leave an accurate record of his greatest exploit, the successful manipulation of U.S. steel shares in the spring. As I understand it, Keene never had an interview with J.P. Morgan about it. Morgan's firm dealt with or through Talbot J. Taylor and company whose office Keene made his headquarters. Talbot Taylor was Keene's son-in-law. I'm assured that Keene's fee for his work consisted of the pleasure he derived from the work, that he made millions trading in the market he helped put up that spring is well known. He told a friend of mine that in the course of a few weeks he sold in the open market for the underwriter syndicate more than 750,000 shares. Not bad when you consider two things, that they were new and untried stocks of a corporation whose capitalization was greater than the entire debt of the United States at that time, and second, that men like D.G. Reed and W.D. Leeds, W.B. Leeds, the Moore Brothers, Henry Phipps, H.C. Frick, and other steel magnets also sold hundreds of thousands of shares to the public at the same time in the same market that Keene helped to create. Of course, general conditions favored him. Not only actual business, but sentiment and his unlimited financial backing made possible his success. What we had was not merely a big bull market, but a boom and a state of mind not, not likely to be seen again. The undigested securities panic came later when Steel Common, which Keene had marked up to 55 in 1901, sold at doesn't give you the price in 1903 and something in 1904. We can't analyze Keene's manipulative campaigns. His books are not available. The adequately detailed record is non-existent. For example, it would be interesting to see how he worked in amalgamated copper. H.H. H. Rogers and William Rockefeller had tried to dispose of their surplus stock in the market and had failed. Finally, they asked Keene to market their line and he agreed. Bear in mind that H.H. H. Rogers was one of the ablest businessmen of his day in Wall Street and that William Rockefeller was the boldest speculator of the entire Standard Oil coterie. They had practically unlimited resources and vast prestige as well as years of experience in the stock market game and yet they had to go to Keene. I mention this to show you that there are some tasks which it requires a specialist to perform. 
Here was a widely touted stock sponsored by America's greatest capitalists that could not be sold except at great sacrifice of the money and prestige. Rogers and Rockefeller were intelligent enough to decide that Keen alone might help them. Keen began to work at once. He had a bull market to work in and sold 220,000 shares of amalgamated around par. After he disposed of the insider's line, the public kept on buying and the price went 10 points higher. Indeed, the insiders got bullish on the stock they had sold when they saw how eagerly the public was taking it. There was a story that Rogers actually advised Keen to go long of amalgamated. It is scarcely recognizable that Rogers meant to unload on Keen. He was too shrewd a man not to know that Keen was not, not a bleeding lamb. Keen worked as he always did, that is, doing his big selling on the way down after the big rise. Of course, his tactical moves were directed by his needs and by the minor currents that change from day to day. In the stock market, as in warfare, it's, it's well to keep in mind the difference between strategy and tactics. One of Keene's confidential men, he is the best fly fisherman I know, told me only the other day that during amalgamated copper campaign, Keene would find himself almost out of stock one day. That is, out of the stock he had been forced to take in marking up the price, and on the next day he would buy back thousands of shares. On the day after that he would sell on balance, then he would leave the market absolutely alone to see how it would take care of itself and also to accustom it to do so. When it came to the actual marketing of the line, he did what I told you. He sold it on the way down. The trading public is always looking for a rally, and besides, there is a covering by the shorts. So that's all I'm going to read there. Uh, it's very deep when we're talking about... I'm not going to use the term manipulating because uh, these cryptocurrencies that I'm involved with here, I'm actually not manipulating them actually don't intel, intend to sell them on the way down. I don't intend to do a pump and dump, but actually intend to accumulate long-term large percentages of these cryptocurrencies. But you can see that there is an art to um, building up interest in a market. Now, these cryptocurrencies, uh, and we're not talking about Ripple or things like that that are connected to... Uh, the government and can be regulated, but actual free markets that have nothing to do with the government, uh, such as this market in Florin coin. Uh, my activity in Florin coin so far, you can see the price has doubled since I began operating in it. It's pretty much been just to accumulate something that I know has value. I'm using both technical and fundamental reasons and uh, ticker tape reasons as well and uh, when you're using all of that at the same time and you have all of those things going for you uh, when you have the fundamentals as we do in silver and when you have the technicals as we do in these cryptocurrencies as well as the fundamentals then it's very easy to get a market going and we'll talk to you next time